Good morning, everyone. Hope uh, you had a good break from those uh, enthralling sessions. I think today's sessions were really awesome, right? I mean, like yesterday's, of course, the keynotes, everything kind of set the stage. But today, I thought that there were a lot of use cases and case studies and, and experiences that, uh, that came out today. So continuing that, I think we, had a, we have a wonderful, wonderful panel. Just to kind of set the context of what we are talking about, we are talking about innovating for India and innovating for the world, right? How can we, we have created this amazing ecosystem in GCOEs, and uh, if you look at the evolution of the GCOEs, you know, as I was talking yesterday as well, and Pari was giving many examples, uh, two, a couple of decades ago, we were talking about, you know, talent and delivery and cost, and then we started talking about delivery excellences and serving the businesses at much higher level, now everything is about innovation. Everything is about, you know, how can you set up those businesses from India, right? How can you support your global business from India? So we are going to continue discussing about, you know, how, how to make that possible, which companies have done that, what are the stories out there that we can learn from, and more importantly, we are going to pick the brain of these, you know, fabulous, you know, uh, leaders here uh, who are going to teach us literally how to do it. So before we do that, I just want to ask a quick question. How many of you here are building products for your global clients? OK, that's good. How many of those products are completely built from India? Wonderful, quite a few of them. So that's primarily what we are going to talk about. Uh, all right, OK, third last question. How many of them are innovated in India for global clients? That's good. I, I think you know, quite a few of them. That, and we were hopefully, in, uh, you know, like when, when we started uh, uh, Zeno Confluence, probably about, you know, this is our 15th year. <laughs> if I had asked the same question, that would have been the number of you know, responses for building the products in India. Forget about delivery, right? So in 15 years, we have come a long way. Hopefully, in the next five years, we will see a lot more hands going up for the same question. So um, let's start with this, Ashish, uh, a question for you. You know, you are in a very unique, uh, I think, company. In Falabella, being a Latin American company, you have a unique dynamics. I think uh, the others have a different dynamics. You have a very different, unique dynamics. You know, one thing that, for at least for a decade, we've been talking about is you build for India, and you build for all emerging countries. Right? Is that true still? And how is that uh, happening in Falabella? So, uh, for us, uh, I mean, one of the unique things about India, you know, uh, from a talent perspective, is it's a gateway to the world, right? So, the people who typically have, are working in our teams or all of us, right? You see, we would have worked in various geographies, but even if you have not actually physically worked in different geographies, you have worked on projects which were in various geographies. So you have actually a global perspective already, more global perspective than you would find in any other country. So when you think about India, it's actually a gateway to the world uh, from a talent and thinking perspective. So I think for Falabella, I mean, the one unique thing for us was, um, which many GCCs don't face, is the whole language difference. In Latin America, there is a Spanish and we have English. And we were talking off stage, I mean, the the visibility that data can give you, sure. uh, and it changes the whole dynamics about whether you have to be, uh, you know, cl closer to your customers or not. And I think with that data ability and with the the talent that understands the world better now, I think what you are doing here uh, has you know a lot of use cases that you are learning. You know what Siddharth is doing with uh, India Stack and other things that are happening in this world. You can take it to anywhere. I do believe uh, there is a lot of learnings from India per se, from an emerging perspective, but also from the talent being working through the global perspective, how to contextualize that learning and taking to the building the products. And that's why you saw so many hands going up because I think we understand not only how to leverage emerging markets, but how to contextualize it to the different markets. Absolutely. Thanks, Ashish. Ajay, I think you, you have a very unique situation, right? You are a very nimble company. I'm like, compared to the large behemoths that have GCOEs here. Uh, and you are also in an industry that is uh, evolving very fast, right? So when you have such a uh, unique center here, how does the dynamics work? Well, I, 
uh, I think India. Uh, I mean, audible. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, so. The dynamics are phenomenal, right? Because we are at a, a place. It's a confluence of great talent, India, especially Bangalore, right? I think uh, you get the world, some of the world's best talent. Um, our belief is like like Alan K said that to build wonderful software, you need to build your own hardware. So you know we are we are really big believers of that. So we kind of do both of that. So the good part is you get like phenomenal software talent here, right? I, th I think some of the dynamics come into play when you are really looking at some phenomenal hardware talent at the same time, right? So I think we are we are trying to kind of get some of that that in. So that's the dynamic. But as such, if you look at it. Um, from my previous experiences, yes, it was, a tr it was a transformative journey, but if I look at it now, there no longer is a question in terms of uh, whether the center can deliver or whether we have great talent. I think those answers are, are there out in the open and those are decided. But I think now the question is, there are so many examples of people who have set the bar high, like for example, uh, I would say that uh, UIDAI or, or, or uh, UPI is a phenomenal example of innovation that's done in India that's world class. Uh, companies like Zerodha have proved that they can make apps better than anybody else and can create phenomenal value in the ecosystem. So we are really held at those standards, right? Yeah. So the people are really expecting our engineers to do to beat world-class outcomes, right? So it's, sure. uh, it's completely by that. So dynamic is all about to be a first citizen of the world, you need to really stand up to the high standards that India has set for itself in the recent past. And, and that's a phenomenal place to be in. You know, it's, it's like living a dream right now. Yeah, we'll come back to the talent question in a minute, Ajay. I think, uh, uh, Girish, I think you have a different, pers uh, you know, you, you, your industry uh, and your markets are primarily in US, but you have a significant talent here. How is that happening for you guys? Building for specifically US market, which is highly regulated US market in the industry that you are in, how are you able to handle that? Well, um, I, I actually want to build a little bit on where Ajaya was as well. Um, I've been doing um, GCOEs in India for about 15 years now. And you know, most people talk about why India, right? So you talk about the fact that there is a um, lot of good technology skills. But you know, what is actually true about India is that people say like the education system doesn't have you know, the creativity or it's very route based and you know, all of those criticism. But what, what I've discovered is that uh, the whole Jugaad culture has creativity built in okay. in just about what we do, right? And then Literally for everything we do um, in our everyday transactions, you are negotiating with somebody, whether it's the auto wala or the sabzi wala or whatever, right? So when you package those three things together where there is a core, um, um, actually technology depth with great negotiation and conflict management skills, packaged with ability to be creative, that forms the nucleus of what you can actually be useful regardless of where you are in the world. Mm. And that's the thing that I'm seeing about India, and that's why we're able to leverage all of the talent here, because it not just brings the talent, it brings the other aspects that make it successful. And we are discovering that that much more now. Probably the thing that has changed in the 15 years is the confidence of the people themselves, right? Awesome. Which is really, all of these existed even when um, I was in India, when I grew up. So my boss you know, now is the CEO of a Fortune you know, 10 company, right? And he grew up in this educational system. He grew up with all these things. And you have to wonder, like, what is so special about him that he goes to the US and becomes a CEO, sure. right? What it was was the lack of confidence or the success factors and so on. In the last 15 years, I've seen a dramatic shift in the body language of folks here and the confidence that comes with it. Probably a great example is look at this on stage, right? <laughs> You wouldn't see that in typical conferences in India where somebody would wear the Indian outfit for a formal conference. That is the fantastic, beautiful confidence that is making all of the rest successful. Absolutely. But to follow up one question uh, for you, Grish, is, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, there was this cons uh, you know, kind of perception that you have to be where the market to invent for that market, right? What changed now? I mean, like so many companies, I mean, like you saw quite a few hands go up that they are serving global markets sitting here. 
What changed? Well, what changed is, is really the fact that there were um, some that unique sexes that started to prove that point. Okay. And the point really was that you know, talent could be anywhere. And I think COVID exacerbated that thing that you could be completely remote and still deliver value irrespective of where you are. So I think even outside of COVID, I think India was getting to that point already, right? Is that there were good shining examples and what happens is that once you see somebody succeed, then it allows the next five people to succeed, and then that mushrooms the ecosystem around it. And that's kind of what you're seeing. So the maturity of the ecosystem. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Siddharth, uh, you know, you, you kind of sit at a very unique vantage point, right? You have seen um, Indian startups being very successful, taking the products to global. I mean, like building products, innovating for the global markets and everything. What is your perception of where GCOEs are today? Like, the, uh, uh, you know, where they are from the maturity curve to solve the global problems? So if I, if I step back a bit uh, before I answer that question, you know, to your point of are we innovating in India? Can you innovate for different markets? At the end of the day, human beings are human beings. We have a base set of needs. Yep. We have a common set of societal challenges that we are facing. We can create a set of, of course, artificial boundaries that we do, but that's the core, that's the essence. Sure. And so what we have in India when you're thinking about firstly solving for 1.3, 1.4 billion people with large amounts of diversity, you know, we have more number of states than Europe has, complex political structures. When we start to think at that scale, and when India has implemented some of these infrastructures, first in the case of identity where we enrolled over a billion people, faster than Google and Microsoft, and people had to stand in line. Uh, in the case of UPI, where again, we took a first principles view, we could have gone the Chinese model or the American, we said, no, given our societal considerations, we need to come up with a new payments architecture. The confidence that he mentioned, uh, and today UPI is the world's most advanced payment system. Sure. We're doing three times the number of transactions than China is doing on a completely open system, a different value system assigned to that. And now in data, uh, what India is building out with the data empowerment and protection architecture is actually, you know, five years back when we were building this out, everyone would tell us there's GDPR, why don't you replicate GDPR, why are you guys creating yeah. things from scratch, the existing standards like OAuth, we said, look, this doesn't fit the problem, certain constructs make sense. Today we are at a point where we are actually in advanced discussions with the European Union where they're like, we want what India has. Mm. And, and so therefore what we are seeing is especially in the current geopolitical shift and, and realignment that's taking place, the infrastructure that we've created here, uh, which is at the level of, product, you know, before you come to even products, uh, for many of the GCOEs, your products are being built on platforms, platforms are being built on protocols. Sure. That protocol thinking, that platform thinking that we have, which is relevant to emerging economies, but also advanced economies, mm. uh, is key. Sure. And, and what we are seeing is that's relevant to, you know, 100 plus countries don't have any of this infrastructure. Your traditionally advanced economies uh, don't have any of this infrastructure. So can we think of an ecosystem? Many of the GCOEs are, you know, essentially building technology. Let's take banking. We are, are running the world's most advanced open banking, open finance system. Yep. Well accepted. Can the GCOEs and the teams understand that, use those protocols, participate in those global conversations that are taking place uh, over and above whatever is happening in their respective market that they're serving? So that's at least how I, from my vantage point, you know, what, what excites us and, and what we are seeing uh, shape uh, in, in this current environment. Are those conversations happening, Siddharth? Which conversations? That GCO is coming to you and saying that help us. No, those are, those are not happening. I okay. mean, that's a gap that I see. <laughs> okay, so, so how can, how? I mean, I'll, are, give, you, I'll give you a simple example. So I was in France recently. Uh, uh, France has announced, you know, they, they have primitive, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, banking infrastructure. Uh, for various reasons, reasons of national sovereignty, which President Macron talks about, uh, and beyond, they want to move towards better real-time payments, better identity systems, better data sharing systems. Now let's take payments for a minute, right? Uh, we've solved that problem in India. Uh, the, there are about three, four large French banks. Uh, all the tech for that is being built in Bangalore. Sure. So are those teams aware, you know, saying, hey, look, this is the advanced open banking infrastructure. Are we still drinking the Kool-Aid that came from another country? 
Got right? It. When those guys itself are having conversations at a policymaker level with us, saying, you know, we want to realign standards, we want to harmonize policy frameworks. Sure. And so I think that's a huge strategic asset we have, which most other countries don't. Mm. And I think that if that thinking can take place, if those connections can happen uh, with the uh, relevant ecosystem stakeholders, I think that will be very powerful in sort of our next wave of globalization. No, I, I think that hey, it's hey, a Wam, very Wamsi, powerful statement. Wamsi, if I statement. can ask him. Yeah. So, is there, a, is there a possibility that someday like SWIFT can be replaced by UPI as far as a company? Absolutely. So we are now at a point where we are saying, let's not just take a seat at the table. Earlier on, we were scared to take a seat at the table. Now we are saying, let's build the table ourselves and invite others. Different table. Yeah, I think that's, exactly. that's, the, that's, a, that's a phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the fundamental thing is, I think many of us, I think including me, I'll tell you, we, are, we do not appreciate so much what is happening in the ecosystem that is outside of our comfort zone, right? I think this is a great example where there is unbelievable stack that is built. And I, I can, I, I'm pretty sure that every one of you in this room is using the stack that uh, Siddharth is mentioning. And it's just that we are not taking the, that stack and figuring out how we can take that to our own global customers. I think this is a great opportunity for us to look at that. So thank you, Siddharth. So, if people are interested, how do they connect? I mean, I'm happy to speak with them, and there are many yeah, other so, uh, companies in this perfect, space that perfect. are... But, uh, you know, give us an example. Is there a startup that leveraged the, you know, India stack to build global products? Yeah, so we are in the... So I would say we are in the phase one of that. The first attempt that happened in the case of identity was an open source effort called Mozip, which is housed in Triple IT Bangalore. And so that is now, in fact, the national ID systems in Morocco and Philippines are actually running on an open source implementation of Aadhaar. Sure. Now, it so happens that, you know, there are a range of companies, a bunch of startups that are involved that have participated in that implementation there. Uh, in the case of UPI and in the case of data, it's much early on. Uh, but what's now taking place is also, because I think we have a similar problem with not just uh, 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 in terms of thinking within GCOEs, but even within product, existing Indian product companies, right? Because global first is a very different mindset. And so what we're now seeing, especially in the run-up India hosts the G20 next year, the idea is can we rev up the ecosystem? Uh, can we all come together? And at least in the areas of identity payments and data, uh, You'll see, of course, new tables being built, new stand global, global neutral stand standards being set. And that creates an enormous opportunity for, of course, existing companies to align, but new companies to be built. Absolutely. Great point. I think let's move on to a different topic in the interest of time. Uh, we'll start with you, Ashish. You, you've been in GCO ecosystem for a long time. What, in your perspectives, are the pivotal moments, or what are the two, three things that the audience here have to look for to make the transition from going about thinking about, okay, I'm doing what I'm doing, but if I want to think about a completely different problem that my, pro my, my company hasn't solved yet, or something that I can argument on my existing products, what are those pivotal things that you have seen happen? Yeah. So before I specifically answer that, I, I was reflecting on what uh, Siddharth just said, and, uh, you know, and I was wondering, 10, 12 years back when there were a lot of executive visits that used to happen from a global executive leadership to India. And the theme of those visits and theme of the discussions were what can we do from India, mm -hmm. right? And you typically go to different uh, GCOAs, different IT companies, service companies, and you talk about stuff. Uh, recently, if last few years, if I see the executive visit happen, it's mostly about what can we learn from India that we can take back, right? So there are a lot of meetings will happen with to understand India stack, a lot of VCs meetings will happen to understand what is a startup ecosystem and obviously other IT companies. So I think that fundamentally has changed in the mindset of the global world of how to learn from India versus doing it from India, which was sure. the theme changing. To yes. me, um, to your question on uh, what was the pivotal point or what is the main thing, I think it's... Um, it's a lot to do with uh, GCOA leadership team and a mm. lot of uh, all of us who have been running this is, um, you know, I think the GCOE has to become a means, not an end in itself, right? And many times I think when 50 or maybe initial stages of GCOA, it was a lot about being an end and being thinking about how do I bring a talent and how do I create a capacity. And I think what has changed in, in the mindset is how do you 
uh, solve, like what you said, a big problems, or how do you make people think a bigger dream? Yep. I think, I, I personally feel that, uh, you know, that second stage was solving a big problem. Now I think what is happening is, at least I see in Falabella is saying, no, 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 this is not the problem we're solving. You have defined a wrong problem. Um, and India gives you a, you know, a different level of a scale to think, right? And then you redefine the problem to come up with a, a different thinking. And then you, that gives you, the initial successes gives you seat on the table. And now I think we are getting to a stage where you are in a position to influence and you are seeing a lot more global roles coming out of India. Can, sure, Garish, can, you can have. I add to it? Um, so, um, I've, um, you know, so there is like a pivotal point at different levels, right? Um, there is one really critical pivotal point I look for in all of my team. Hmm. It is that of having an opinion, right? The minute they have an opinion, that means that they understand the business, they understand the dynamics, whether it's the right opinion or wrong opinion, that pivotal point when they start to have an opinion and have an opinionated view of where the business or the trajectory of the team, the product, the company should go, that is the pivotal point that marks the, the maturity of the organization, of the team, and so on. So I look for that. Okay. It's a great litmus test for me is that the stronger the opinion, that means that much more that they really understand. Confidence, yeah. So, Ex uh, picking on that, Ajay, I mean, like you, you've been in multiple GCOAs. You have, you have seen the transformation, slow transformation, then in exponential growth, uh, everything coming from India. What kind of a leadership structure do you look for to create that kind of an organization? So I, I think it needs to be a structure of ownership where you know, you're not really uh, dependent on decision making in multiple geographies. So uh, the philosophy currently is that every center has a charter and full ownership and, and, and they define the destiny of it, which means you have your product management teams, uh, you know, maybe locally focused or globally focused, but you do have it because now this is a connected world and that can happen. So, so you basically own the destiny, so that's, that's important so that you can drive it. So that's, that's one thing. Second thing is, um, while we are thinking about local innovation, global innovation, whether you can actually force fit a product that you have globally in a local market, or you need to innovate for local markets. Uh, in the previous companies that I've worked for, I've seen that people have built teams that focus local for local, so they can build products that are relevant for the local market. And, and people who have been doing that have found a lot of success in their careers because that's tougher than actually being in a typecast mode and building it globally. Because we have seen a lot of global products fail yep. in China and India. And the, the local products that existed here have actually won. Although like the models were different or whatever, you can't really morph it, right? So that's one, one scheme of thought. So whatever you do, even if you're doing innovation locally or you want to do it for globally, I think with, with the kind of connected world that we are in, we we should have like full accountability, ownership in, in whatever you do, have a product management arm, have your technical marketing engineering, have your customer support, core engineering, so that they can operate as a small startup. And we've seen that those are highly successful, sure. nimble, and can deliver more results. Great. Picking on that, Girish, I think a different vantage point. I mean, like you are in the, in the headquarters, where the business and the headquarters is, and you, know, you have an unbelievable team here. What other things, other than people having opinions, what other characteristics do you look for when you say if they are going to come within, um, uh, with a business plan? What do you look for? Well, um, I'll, I'll actually look for something different than Ajaya. He said be controversial. So, um, I, so, I, so I think um, a lot of the ways that teams in India operate um, is this notion that things have to be local. Mm. Right. Um, if you are a leader in a global thing, you operate in a boundaryless manner. Right. The more people here can think of like, hey, you know, I could have a team in China and that's fine. I am a global leader. Um, I think that's more important than have to fixate on somebody physically or geographically located in India. Great um, I think the more the more people have the mindset that I am a global leader, it really doesn't matter where my teams are located. I think is the thing that actually would make them tremendously successful.
useful. So this boundaryless thing is probably the thing. What but other but things that you look well, like when people I, come hold on, hold on. So I, I think I agree with him. Like you know, as a leader, you have to be a global leader. You could have teams wherever. Sure. I'm more referring to the products that get innovated locally. Absolutely. Like I could have a locally product that uh, gets innovated that with sense. all the yeah. teams here, but at the same time, I have a team in say in in Mountain View which has a local ecosystem of its own. So it's got nothing to do with leadership, it's got to do with products. Products, yeah. yeah. But, sense, but totally. just to add from a talent gap perspective or what to look in a talent, I feel um, we were, we had a recently offsite and we were reflecting upon that. So what is that next thing? I feel there is a lot of good talent thinking ha and has a good opinionated point of views on how part of it. I still feel there is a gap and we need to push a little bit more in India talent about the why part of it, why you are doing it. And I see, you know, and that's why I think product management becomes a very critical part because product management is typically trying to answer the why part and not how part. And typically what I have seen over GCO is we have got really, really good and opinionated about how it should be architected, how we should change the process, and we are still not at the level or most of the talent is not at the level where they are questioning the why part why of part. it. And I think if you have to get to the innovation stage of it and really do that, that part, that skill, capability, and the talent training has to happen, I think. So let me actually ask the answer, uh, audience a question. How many of you here are product managers? Quite a few of them, right? I think, see, oftentimes, you know, companies have always said that for a Product, you know, you cannot innovate if, unless you have the product. We all agree that, right? And there is a second perception is, okay, the product managers don't understand the product unless they live in the market and they experience the market. They are interacting with the clients more often, right? How did that change? Let's, actually, let's start with you, Ashish. I mean, like, you know, now you are, you are, you are serving Latin American market, which many of us are not aware of, I mean, like, to be honest, right? I mean, like, we kind of understand the the U.S. European markets because we've been interacting with them for at least 20 years from the GCOEs, not, uh, and the Latin American markets also have not interacted so much with, uh, with, with India. So how do you, how do you, how are you solving that problem? So uh, before even uh, answering the question on like uh, being in the market and experiencing it, let me answer with how to deal with without being even knowing the language. Yeah. So <laughs> it goes a one step before, right? And there's the English and Spanish, right? And uh, I was joking around with my boss and he said, you know, how are you going to deal with that? And I said, okay, so for all these years, 100 years that Falabel has existed, uh, we had a Spanish and we had a Spanish in the business and Spanish in the technology. So the communication was perfect, right? All projects were on time, all requirements were met. And they said, no. I said, okay, let's try with a different language now. So maybe that will push you to be more clear on that. So I think... Um, um, what I learned working in a different language context is personally is when you know there are certain constraints you work harder to get to know, yeah. right? Uh, you don't take things for granted. So when you are not in a region where you are actually experiencing, you take extra effort to understand and looking at the data, looking at the consumer behaviors and uh, bringing the context to what you know through your past experiences or through India and say, okay, why it is applicable? What's going to be a difference between building a product which is designed for a billion, billion people versus a country where the population is 20 million, mm -hmm. right? So how do you adjust the product with that? How do you adjust the cost factors according to that, right? And I think that whole desire, and he kind of touched upon this India mindset of being creative and finding a solution for your context, this is embedded in us. Right, we find a solution. So I know we're running out of time. I think that's a great point. I think uh, you know the data has become your market. I think right. there is enough tools that capture your customer behavior, your market trends that you don't have to be, uh, you know, ingrained into the market itself. So um, I know we have uh, just two minutes. So let's see if there are any interesting questions from the audience. I have many questions, but we'll reserve that. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, people are still processing. Okay, Siddharth, uh, here's the question We have been very for... clear on this. <laughs> okay, we, we, have, we have enough things to do. Siddharth, one, one question for you. Which industries do you think can, can leverage the strength of India to solve the global problems? I, I, in, in my opinion, I think all, okay. in different ways. 
uh, because the question is how Let's do you take think the priority order all yeah, is not an answer if you think strategically uh, in in an order of priority i think one is very clearly uh, defense and nuclear related aspects uh, i think uh, aside from that uh, it's very clear especially when it comes to within the technology domain that we are used to uh, identity payments data data governance uh, where we are at the frontier um, and you know when you double click on data governance it goes into confidential computing you know the entire stack um, uh, ai okay. uh, just purely given the scale and the amount of data we are generating in some cases in some of these platforms we do have one of the most advanced ai recognition verification models um, so i would say broadly at least to start off with uh, I think I would say banking for sure uh, might be a great place. The building blocks exist, the thinking exists, and it's a here and now uh, problem. Uh, can, I, can I disagree on the same with context. him, or actually uh, maybe agree with him more violently in that I think healthcare is probably the thing yeah, that India absolutely. can actually do dominantly better than anywhere in the globe. Okay. Right? Because um, the India stack that's being built, where the identity of the person is known, the ability to interact with that person is known. Now attaching their entire um, health identity to it, it can massively make a difference. So there is a health stack being built. Uh, the Ayushman Bharat uh, Digital Health Mission, which uh, Prime Minister Modi launched, is essentially delivering a health ID, and then the idea is to layer it with personal health, decentralized personal health records. Which could be so massively I, I, and powerful. And then telehealth in a completely open, interoperable way. So just to you know round that up, I think. Uh, and reframe in addition to banking plus healthcare, but really the central idea of bringing open networks. Okay. And we are applying open networks in banking. You've seen it. We are applying open networks in healthcare. We are applying open networks in commerce with ONDC, uh, which some of you may have heard. And it's clear that the global market is now looking for that solution, sure. uh, given the shift in the capitalistic model that's happening. So I would say that, you know, to broaden it, banking, healthcare, commerce, open networks would probably be a good focus. Yeah, last, qu last question to you, Ajaya. What, what do you think? I mean, like, you know, you, you have experience in multiple industries. Like, do you, have you seen any industry kind of accelerate much faster than the others? No, no, certainly. I think uh, they're quite apparent, right? I think definitely on the BFSI, I think we have accelerated far ahead. I think every, anybody who lands here are like blown away by the uh, the ubiquity of, of of ability to do transactions. I think that's one thing. And definitely, the second one definitely is health. And, and I know that we are like thinking way ahead. I mean, I've worked in companies where we're looking at monitoring patients remotely and making blood diagnostics ubiquitous and then use better methods to get healthcare to the lowest common denominator. I think these are the two things I think we've just raced away from the rest of the world and pulled away in a, in a different way. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably is a great takeaway actually. You know, if, if Wonderful. UPI for the world, maybe yeah. if that's like the takeaway of this panel, I think that's, that's, that's just phenomenal. No, I think the I think. takeaway of the panel is everybody has to talk to Siddharth. No, no. <laughs> I, I think that is the biggest yeah, takeaway. Yeah. It looks like you guys are not collaborating with yeah. uh, with what is built locally, so that is that seems to be very apparent. But we are times up a uh, while ago, so but you know it's a it's, it's a wonderful panel. I cannot thank you guys enough for sharing this. I think it's a wonderful wisdom. More than anything, I think uh, I think Girish, what you talked about opinions or what you uh, Ajaya, what you talk about the confidence or uh, the, you know the diversity of the talent and the ecosystem that we have built. Uh, um, uh, Ashish, as well as what the, you know, the, the importance of uh, leveraging what we have already built to build our own tables, Siddharth. I think that you know those are all unbelievable uh, real-life uh, best practices that I hope everybody can take it. Question whatever you are doing and how you can actually collaborate with this ecosystem to solve the problems that nobody else anywhere can solve it because no one has the ecosystem that we have in India and especially in Bangalore, right? That is the truth. So with that, I'll, uh, again, once again, thank you very, very much. You so much. And, uh, you know, all of you have a great rest, great, of, uh, you know, great conference again. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.